So in this video I'm going to show you how to calculate groundwater flow by hand um, and it's this same technique really that um, computer software packages use so it's, um, it's useful to know at least how they operate um, from first principles. Um, and to do, that, to do this by hand we, we draw something called a flow net. Now a flow net is a, um, is a diagram which shows, the, uh, shows flow lines, so lines of uh, water flow. Um, against uh, equipotential lines. So equipotential lines are lines that um, depict um, the, uh, areas in the soil with the same pressure. So I'll use red for flow lines. In my diagram. And I'll use blue for equipotential lines. And a flow net is constructed of both flow lines and equipotential lines. So for flow nets to be effective, they need to observe uh, certain rules. The first is that flow lines and, and equipotential lines must cross at right angles. You can't uh, cross these at any other angle. The second is that um, flow lines cannot cross other flow lines. That would imply that the uh, water molecules are existing within the same space, so um, that can't happen. To uh, similarly, equipotential lines can't cross other equipotential lines. If an equipotential line denotes um, an area of the same pressure, then they can't cross by definition. Impermeable boundaries are always flow lines, so you always get flow around an impermeable boundary. Um, so that's another rule. Similarly, uh, water bodies within uh, your system are equipotential lines. And finally, um, for, flow nets, for the maths in flow nets to work, you need to draw um, uh, curvilinear squares. So what are curv curvilinear squares? Well, um, if I have a, a flow line, or two flow lines um, that I've drawn, and let's say the water is flowing like this. Well, uh, to form a curvilinear square, I need to draw my equipotential lines to form a shape that looks like this. So my equipotential lines should look something like this, where I can um, draw a circle within this, this space. Um, so that's a curvilinear square, and this is probably one of the hardest things to do within a flow net, um, uh, at least drawing it by hand. Um, and it's often where some of the, the, the mistakes crop in when you're doing a flow net. Um, so th the trick really to, doing it, to, to, to getting this, this diagram right, is, or getting a flow net right, is to draw it as big as possible and you use a pencil first because you never get it right first time. So, so do multiple iterations to make sure you get um, as curvilinear, curvilinear squares as possible. Okay, so um, those are the rules for a, a flow net. Let's look at more uh, realistic, or uh, 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 an example of, of drawing a flow net. Now to draw a flow net, we need to know uh, some things about the geometry of the system we're looking at. So let's say we have a, um, uh, an, an example that looks like this, where we have a, an impermeable material, and sitting on top of that material is some sort of permeable material. Um, so we know water can flow through this, this permeable material. Now let's say we, we drive a, a sheet pile through that, that material like this. And on one side of the sheet pile we have a high water table and at the other side we have a low water table. Now for a, uh, to draw a flow net we need to know what the, the geometry is here. So in this example we have two meters on one side of water and one meter on the other side of water. We have uh, five meters depth of this pile into ten meter um, uh, a body of permeable material. So we know the geometry. So from that we can start to construct our flow net. So the, the best place to start with a flow net is to uh, start with um, 
uh, the realization of points two and three, and that impermeable boundaries are floor lines, and um, uh, bodies of water are equipotential lines. So we can draw a floor line on the bottom of this this profile, um, because this is an impermeable boundary. So that's our first floor line. Um, and this sheet pile wall is also an impermeable boundary, so we can draw a floor line around here. So that means in this situation we have particles of water moving along this boundary um, as part of the, the water flow. We can draw our first equipotential lines on. So we know that at the base of this, this water body, well at the top of the water body we have constant water pressure at zero, and at the bottom we also have constant water pressure. So we can draw our first equipotential line here. First two equipotential lines. Now what we want to do now is divide up the rest of this space with flow lines and equipotential lines um, to be able to um, draw uh, curvy linear squares. So the first uh, step I, I suggest doing is draw your flow lines in. And the best way of doing that is cutting up this, this space here between the bottom of the sheet pie wall and the impermeable boundary. So there must be some flow um, lines that exist within here. So I would maybe pick, if you, if you pick too few uh, flow lines, you, your, your diagram um, doesn't really quite work. But if you put too many in, you end up getting two small squares, and it starts to become a little bit confusing. So it's a bit of, um, you need a bit of experience in drawing these to get it right. So do practice and, and, and make sure you, you, can, you can do this in a sensible way. So I would start maybe at least dividing it up into two. And those flow lines would then um, uh, join the, uh, uh, depict the water movement through this material. So you could imagine them um, uh, being drawn in this sort of um, shape. And they'll have to cross these equipotential lines up here at right angles. So we can draw our first, our second, oh. so we can draw our next flow lines like this. Now those must cross this equipotential line at right angles. You can't have um, them, them crossing sort of in this angle because that's, that's wrong. So they must cross at right angles. Right, now what you've got to do now is try and um, uh, cut up this, this diagram into circumlinear squares. Now this is when it starts to become um, a bit iterative and you'll need to uh, rub things out and um, put new uh, flow lines in and new equipotential lines in. But let's start up here. So we draw our first circumlinear square and remember we have to cross at right angles uh, between equipotential line and flow line. So it might look something like this. Now you can see that th there's maybe something wrong with this shape. So my, what, I, my, what I might want to do is then redraw um, uh, this flow line to sort of bring it in a bit. But let's, let's do that in a sec. Let's try and draw a few more of these equipotential lines on. So we can draw another one here. Again, careful to cross at right angles. And then we can see that there's maybe something, a problem here with the, uh, with the circumlinear square. That's certainly not right. Um, and then we'll draw another one here. So you can see that maybe there's, uh, uh, these look okay. So these look like I've got um, circumlinear squares in. I can draw circles that fit reasonably into these. But you, you can see that maybe there's a problem here. So my, what I might want to do is bring this, um, this flow line up a little, um, into, the, into the diagram a bit more. So that looks a little bit better. We can now uh, I draw circumlinear, uh, well, we draw circles in, in those, and they look 
reasonably okay. Uh, so let's keep going. Um, and you can see that this is possibly, um, could, this flow line could possibly be a, bit, a little bit lower. So I could draw that to a situation like that. So with a bit of care and a bit of attention, you can probably do a bit better than what I've done here, but um, it generally demonstrates the principles where we have, we're trying to form curvy linear squares um, on our, on our um, sheet of paper. Graph paper would, um, would help a lot in this case. Okay, so what's the next step? Well, the next step is um, we count up all of the, um, the, the spaces between the flow lines and the spaces between the equipotential lines. So the spaces between the flow lines, well, we have one here, we have two, and we have three. So we have um, three spaces between the, the flow lines. So NF equals three. We also count up the spaces between the equipotential lines, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have an N uh, H of equal to seven. So these are the NF it represents the number of flow tubes. Uh, that's sometimes how it's referred to, and the uh, NH represents the number of equipotential drops. So this represents a drop in, in pressure. So if we take uh, NF and NH, uh, we can re relate it to the flow through this equation, where the flow equals the permeability multiplied by the AH multiplied by the NF over NH. Well, the permeability we can find through testing this, this material. So we, we, let's say we test it either in the lab or through a pump test, and it had some sort of permeability. And let's say we knew that to be 10 to the minus 6 meters per second. So we knew the permeability of this material. Our H is the, the total head drop um, over the system, so the total pressure difference, um, which is just the difference between these two heights here. So this is H. So if we know K, the permeability, we know H, the head drop, um, and we know the, through the, the flow net we've got uh, an NF value and an NH value, we can work out what the flow is. So in this situation, it would be Q equals 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by 1 meter multiplied by 3 over 7, which equals roughly around 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters cubed per second, which equals roughly around uh, 35 meters per year. And that's for every meter of retaining wall. So. For every meter in the, in, in the, I suppose, the Z direction, in and out of the board here, um, we have 35 liters of, of flow per year. Uh, 